We loved working on this underrated vehicle you'd never call a classic. It's our spicy Granada sleeper, and on the street, this thing kept a low profile, but at the strip, it demanded your attention. We hope you reconsider this forgotten Ford, and if the price of old Granadas goes up, please accept our apology. You're watching Power Nation. <laughs> Today we are out of the shop. It's nice to get out every once in a while and do some actual work on cars. And this is something that I think we can handle, but we don't know because, well, we don't know a lot about it. And we're going down here to check out a 1977 Ford Granada that supposedly ran when parked. You know, everything runs and then you park it. But it doesn't run And then now. it doesn't run anymore. So, you know, that's pretty common. Um, the owner thinks it's something simple, but we're not 100% sure. So the big thing here is we, we got a bunch of parts pre-ordered from Rock Auto, so we're heading down here kind of blind, but we think we can figure it out and hopefully get this thing running again. He said the transmission leaks. This yeah. is a car that this person wants to get back running again so they can drive it and maybe sell it. So uh, uh, it sounded like a cool project. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, the, the old 70s Fords, and uh, this one seems pretty cool. It's, a, it, it's allegedly a V8 car, so uh, we're going to know a whole lot more when we get there. And we're... Uh, I think we're getting close here. Let's look. You know, I, I, yeah, I know we're close. Yep, it should be right up here on the right. All right. All right. Oh, yeah, oh, yep. oh, there it is. Look at. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now we're talking. This is nicer than I thought. It's yeah. It, it's sunk. I like how he rolled the windows down so it would maybe air out. That makes me feel there's gonna be a smell in here. No, there is a smell. <laughs> there's a smell maybe a little here. bit. Yeah. But now look at the inside though. I mean. This thing had to have been garage kept for Look how nice that is. Look at the dash. Yeah, for that not to be cracked, you know. I, I don't see any. I don't see any goofy stuff under that vinyl. No, I think it's just been sitting it's here and it's filthy. dirty. Yeah, just dirty. It's, but. it's it's trying to return to the earth. <laughs> are the keys in it? Make sure the keys are somewhere. Yeah, they're on the floorboard, which okay. you know. Usually, the only reason you leave the keys in the car right. is when it doesn't run. Right. The oil is a little high but it seems clear of any water or fuel, so it was probably just overfilled. The battery was completely dead, so we'll throw on the Matco jump box and see if it'll turn over. Yeah, go ahead. Oh! <laughs> All right. I don't think it tried to fire. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh what? Yeah. It, it's getting gas. It's getting fuel. What does it have for a fuel gauge right now? Let's see. It's got at least a quarter. All right, let's... uh. Yeah, a little over a quarter. That's fine. Right. Well, um, if that's correct, spark. if it moves, let's see if this thing has spark. Yeah, let's check for spark. Um, I'm, just, I'm just gonna pull a plug or pull a wire and see if it touches. I'm gonna pull. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Look at yeah, this. Arc that on something. Hold on. Hold on. So do you have spark? No. No spark. No. Oh, 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 there we go. Oh, here we go. Here's one thing. That's simple. Well, let's let's try this. That's why? This isn't plugged in. It's oh, broken. It's broken. That's why. So it came unplugged, I guess, but. It looks okay, so let's try that. Ooh, I can hear spark that time. Pull a wire and let's see if we actually have spark. Let's start there. Pull a wire? Oh. Yeah, I can I can hear it cracking. Look or at that. Look at why that. don't you watch it? Okay. That is a major piece missing. I said we just put a rotor in it. I just want to see if it runs. We, well, we got the wires, and if it runs, we're going to do all that other stuff, but I want to see if it runs. RockAuto.com offers complete kits for several different jobs, like this United Motor tune-up kit. It comes with a set of spark plug wires, distributor cap, and the rotor that we need. Their website makes it easy to find what you're looking for, and it even makes suggestions for other tools or parts you might need to complete the job. All right, let's try that. Oh, <laughs> oh she's a little smoky. Yeah, holy moly. And it's, it's got only, a dead hole. Yeah, it's only on seven. It's got a little bit of a uh, valve tray noise. Runs pretty good though. I mean, that's it's not bad. Running. Now that we know it runs, we can install the rest of the tune-up kit and look for the cause of our dead cylinder. Well, that sounded nice. Oh, there, there's the problem. The wire. Where's the rest of it? Is right there, but <laughs> somebody has, has ripped that out at one point and also ripped the boot, but right. well, I think that's our culprit. Do you know the firing order of this? Good reason is I don't have to, because it's 1542-6378. Oh. Work smarter, not harder, right? <laughs> or you can just know. If you didn't know and were not familiar, you would just change them one at a time, right? Yeah, if you didn't know the firing order and didn't know where number one is, but these actually have it marked on the rotor, which is super helpful. These are marked, so you can go one, no. 
and you just do this, and then you throw them away, and... <laughs> you don't even have to take them off if you don't want, because <laughs> we're changing that anyway. Right. Okay. Now, fresh rotor. <laughs> yeah, keep that, don't we, throw we have that to away use uh, Oh, yeah, Ford Blue. Yeah. Here, here's your numbers, so you know where Oh, that's goes. handy. To clean out the innards of the distributor, Seafoam's deep creep penetrating lubricant makes it easy to wipe out the dirt and debris. The plugs are fouled, so we will replace them with a brand new set from rockauto.com. We'll gap them to the spec that Rock Auto gives for our application, which is 50 thousandths. The dielectric grease came with the tune-up kit. Very convenient. With any tune-up, a fresh air filter is a great idea. Hey! Hold out your hand. Look at that. You always find good stuff. I mean, it's broken, but now we know where it went. Oh, that's perfect. Ooh, that's all automatically nicer. That purrs like a kitten. The smoke is less, sort of. Yeah, so it's definitely charging, just had a dead battery, but that's good to know the charging system actually works. All right, you dirty dog. Please move under your own power. The owner was kind enough to let us take the Granada back to the shop to work on the transmission leak. Oh, oh, there's something. Oh. <laughs> Since it's 102 degrees out today, we'll gladly accept that offer. Up next, with just a few hours work, the old Ford becomes roadworthy again. We look good in this. We've got the Granada back in the shop, trying to find the source of a substantial transmission leak. This car is very, very nice underneath. A quick inspection told us two things. One, this car is super clean and rust free. Two, the transmission pan gasket is clearly the source of the leak. Now, you've seen this, right? Yeah, you notice there's some signs. There's some signs this thing's been out. There's no washer here. There's some pry marks. There's, there's some, some dents. <laughs> there's, there's bolts that obviously don't go yeah. where there's they are. At least it's kind of stuck down. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. There oh, go. oh, let her go. That worked pretty good. Not bad. There you go. Thank you. Smells good. Doesn't smell burnt. I'm not going to say it smells good. It smells like it's supposed to. Uh, there's the normal amount of, you know, yuck. silveriness in it, but there's no, like, no. chunks. Oh, yeah. We went to rockauto.com for a new gasket along with a few other helpful items. Even though the 1977 Granite is definitely not one of the most popular cars on the roads these days, they had a big selection of parts for the Ford, including economy, OEM replacement, and performance options. After scraping off the remainder of the gasket and cleaning the pan, the new filter with the check ball is installed. When tightening down the pan, don't get too aggressive or you could squish or tear the gasket. When you're poking around under a car, sometimes you find unexpected things like a loose engine mount. This just needs to be tightened. After lubing the new oil filter, we'll spin it on. Both the filter and oil came from rockauto.com. Any engine, especially an older one like this, will benefit from seafoam motor treatment. It helps clean up any built up deposits or crud and doesn't contain any chemicals that can harm your engine. We'll pour in the recommended amount for our engine's oil capacity. Next, we'll add new transmission fluid. To help clean out the fuel system, we'll add seafoam motor treatment to the gas tank as well. Well, we got all the big stuff done on this Granada, so we're gonna move on to something that may seem trivial, but is pretty important, and that's the backup lights. If you paid attention when the car was backing in, it actually had one of the lights out. The great thing about getting parts from rockauto.com is that you can not only get OE style replacement parts, but you can get aftermarket parts. And so we're gonna upgrade these reverse lights to a set of LEDs. These are gonna be much brighter, they have a nice white light, and since they're LED, they're gonna last much longer. Since we gotta change one, might as well change both, and then this car 
will be roadworthy. This is an easy job. It only takes a couple of minutes and a screwdriver. Now our vintage ride has bright, modern lighting. You can easily tell the difference between the old incandescent and the new LED light. Man, this is a cruiser. This is sweet. We look good in this. With just a few hours work, the Granada is running clean and back on the road. Some of you may disagree, but we think that the Ford Granada shows plenty of promise as a project vehicle. Except for its engine. It's anemic. Today on Engine Power, we fix that. Today on Engine Power, we're going to do something that we have not done in a while. A car! Now, if you remember right, we helped an owner get this car running because they wanted to sell it. Well, it turns out we decided we couldn't live without it. So after a little bit of paper changed hands, we are now the proud owners of this 1977 Ford Granada Ghia. Now, it didn't run that great, and it took a little bit of work to get it into this spot. Here's how that looked. Even though it had been sitting in a yard for a while, sporting a very flat tire and the usual signs of old age, it was clear that the owner of this Granada took good care of it. The paint was in excellent shape, and the frame and body were almost rust-free. At first, the engine didn't run at all. After troubleshooting a couple of issues, we found the problem, a distributor that was missing its rotor. After replacing the rotor, cap, plugs, wires, and air filter, the engine ran pretty well, and the smoke started to clear up. Back in the shop, we discovered a worn-out gasket was the source of the transmission leak. After changing the filter and gasket, we gave the Granada fresh transmission fluid along with an oil change. Finally, we upgraded the old reverse lights to LEDs. After a few minutes cruising around in this old Ford, we couldn't stand the idea of parting with it. This car is exceptionally clean and relatively low miles, but you're probably wondering, why a Granada? Well, it's not the raciest of cars, and it might not be your piece of pie, but for us, that's perfect, because this is going to be a sleeper of sorts. That means giving the engine a bunch more power, doing the drivetrain suspension upgrades that go with it, but not really touching the look of the car. But before we do all of that, we need a baseline dyno run, so we're going to get it on the chassis dyno and make a few pulls. Speaking of that, maybe we should name this pumpkin pie. I love pie. Sounds good. Are you dynoing? That's weird. Yes. See what this thing does. I think it's more exciting sometimes to do the baseline. Because after you build something, you kind of know what it's gonna do. I like, I just like to see the change. Like, this thing's probably not gonna make a lot of power. So it'll be fun to see the before and after, you know? Right. There we go. It didn't like a wide open throttle. <laughs> nah, it was a little rough. Definitely starting to miss there. <laughs> Not bad though. 101 <laughs> and 185 pounds. Triple pounds-y. digits. It made triple digits on the first. I mean, hit. that's that's not bad. These things made like 120 or 130 uh, yeah. stock. So you know, that's that's what they claim. So that's that's pretty good. I I'm I'm pumped. It made a, a hundred horse. Let's, let's let's do one more. Ninety-nine. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's about the same. It was a kind of has that natural rev limiter. Yeah, whatever the, whatever that was. <laughs> I think it's a, a combination of two barrel, and it doesn't like anything that we're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's old and tired, so it just we can mess with it and see if we can get it to go a little bit better. But the only thing you would really do is jack the timing up or something yeah. like that with this. We can do something really easy and pull the air cleaner off. Let's see if we can remove some restriction. I'll I'll wait till you do that modification. These are the easy mods I like. Ah, yeah. Oh, we might have got a little more RPM out of it. Yeah, it's 
about the same. 99, ah. basically 100. All right, well, that's about the same. Whenever you pull the engine from an older vehicle, it's always good to have a plan B. Up next, plan B. The baseline dyno runs confirmed what we already knew. This Granada has plenty of potential, but it needs some major power plant upgrades. After removing the drive shaft, we'll cut out the exhaust system and drop the transmission. Ooh. I was, yeah, was going to re recommend don't pull that. Oh, you should have said that. But too late now. Too late now. One thing we really like about older cars, there's usually plenty of room to work in the engine bay. Even though we took our time and carefully removed the engine, it only took a couple of hours. There's not a lot of electronics on this 302, just a bunch of vacuum lines. Good on the front, just make Didn't, sure we're not catching anything nah, in the back and we're good. No, None back, those, back, back squat, we are, we are, we're looking good. A clean engine has several benefits. It keeps dirt and crud from getting into the block during teardown and reassembly. It also makes it easier to spot any leaks. Plus, it's just more enjoyable to work on. We are reusing some of the front accessories and bracketry, so we'll put them off to one side. Oh, Look at that. No broken ones. Nice. Oh. Heck yeah, look at that. The teardown revealed an engine in really good condition. Oh yeah, I got them. But when we removed the cylinder heads, we found a set of 60 over pistons in the bores. Uh-oh. Anticipating this was going to be a standard bore, we ordered 30 over parts for the piston, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just what happens when you order parts before you tear think something down. Right. It's kind of a gamble we took, and right. normally we would wait you know, to see, but from, uh, from just a from a time standpoint, we kind of needed to get them. So that's just a gamble that we took, and so. I have a solution. Yeah, I know what your solution is. I have a block that's been used in a previous project. Yep. It's already 30 over. It's going to have, be, have to be touched on the hone. And we can freshen it up. And, and we can freshen one. up, but we're going to have to use that because obviously it, it would take more time to switch out the pistons to get a, to yeah. get a 60 over pistons. We'll take advantage of our in-house Sun and SV15 and torque plate hone the donor block for proper piston skirt clearance and cylinder finish. Even though this block has been run before, we wanted to change up some tolerances for our application, opening up the bores by one and a half thousandths. We'll check our results often as we go. The auto dwell feature makes achieving proper board geometry much easier. While Frankie cleans the crankshaft with lacquer thinner, I'll apply a thin layer of Total Seal assembly lube to the freshly cleaned cylinder walls. After checking vertical oil clearance for all of the main bearings, they drop into place, followed by assembly lube and the crankshaft itself. Smooth. Next comes the main girdle and ARP main bolts. This block was previously align honed with the girdle in place, so we'll reinstall it. The main bolts are torqued to 70 pound-feet. Our rotating assembly came with a Molly Power Pack piston ring kit that includes one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter rings. Top ring gap is set at 26 thousandths and the second ring gap is 28. This is the correct gap for our current application and anything else we might spray it with. We'll assemble the 4032 alloy forged Molly pistons and our Eagle 5400 long forged H-beam rods. They come with 7 16 ARP 8740 connecting rod bolts. With the rings completely cleaned, they can be installed on the pistons. The first and second ring gaps are placed 180 degrees apart in line with the wrist pin. The oil control ring gaps are also 180 degrees apart, but offset from the wrist pin. Before they drop in, the rods and pistons receive a coat of assembly lube.
Up next, the small block gets sporty aluminum cylinder heads and a valve train designed for high RPM fun. Because this is a special build, we're installing a custom ground billet solid roller camshaft from Comp. We picked out the lobes from their high torque series with the intake's duration of 248 degrees at 50 thousandths lift and the exhaust duration of 260 degrees. The lobe lift for each is 406 thousandths and they are set on a 110 degree lobe separation angle. We also converted the firing order to that of a late model 5.0 and 351 Windsor. We'll use orange thread locker to keep the comp bronze retainer plate in place. The cam is rotated by a comp billet double roller timing set with a nine keyway adjustable crank sprocket. Next, we degreed the cam. We set it at 105 and a half degrees of intake center line, which is four and a half degrees advanced to give us great street manners. Then we'll check piston to valve clearance with the head gasket, cylinder head, and valve train mocked up. The exhaust has 155 thousandths and the intake has 171 thousandths. Plenty. After applying a thin layer of silicone to the front of the engine, we'll gently press the timing cover gasket into place. We left the outside of the timing cover looking a little crummy to keep this engine from drawing attention, but the inside is perfectly clean. After we press on the balancer, we can tighten down the bolts. We're using a Chrome Molly ARP oil pump drive shaft along with a Melling high volume oil pump that's been clearanced for the front main bolt. The Canton oil pump pickup is a specific match for our Canton front sump road race pan that we found at Summit Racing Equipment. The pan is held down by a black oxide six point ARP bolt kit. To go with our custom cam, we got a set of Comp Sportsman solid roller lifters with bushed rollers, which will handle our extreme street application. Like we said, and you've probably noticed, we're trying to make this engine as inconspicuous as possible. We're not trying to make it look stock, but we are going to use as much of the stock componentry as we can in order to disguise how much power it's actually going to make. We're not going to compromise when it comes to performance though, especially on the fasteners, and that's why we're going to be using ARP head bolts on this build. This head bolt kit was specifically recommended by the head manufacturer, and there's a really important reason for that. These heads are made to fit both 289 and 302 Windsors, which have a 716 head bolt, and 351 Windsors, which have a half inch head bolt. This kit comes with insert washers that locate the 716 bolts inside the half inch cylinder head holes. ARP does a great job of working directly with manufacturers to create a bunch of different kits for specific applications, so it's important to read the instructions and make sure you're getting the right ones. The instructions that came with our kit clearly say to put ARP Ultra Torque underneath the head of the bolt leave the bottom of the washer dry, and since our head bolt holes go directly into the water jacket, we have thread sealer on the threads. We'll get our AFR 205 cylinder heads on, and then we can bolt them down. The AFR Renegade 205s have a 2080 stainless intake valve and a 1600 stainless exhaust, housed in a fully CNC'd 58cc chamber. The 205 refers to the intake port CCs, and we have a 1550 OD heavy duty valve spring set up for our solid roller. With a 4060 by 27 thousandths thick Cometic head gasket, we have a measured compression ratio of 10.84 to 1. The heads are torqued in multiple steps to a value of 70 pound feet. Our valve train is full of high quality components, like this Jessel Sportsman 1.6 ratio shaft rocker system. This, along with the Comp 6850 long 3 8 diameter push rods, will keep the valve train under control at high RPM. The advantage of a shaft rocker system is increased rigidity, accurate geometry, and the ability to withstand heavy abuse under any application. These are higher end racy components, but they're easy to find at Summit Racing Equipment. They are installed in the firing order, and then lash is set cold at 18 thousandths across the board. AFR recommends these Felpro gaskets to match their intake port. We'll put down a bead of silicone on the china walls and around the coolant ports. Then the Edelbrock Victor Jr. intake manifold is carefully set into position and torqued to 22 pound-feet. 
Our engine is almost completely together and there's only a few parts we need before we can give it a paint job to help disguise some of the new pretty parts that we've been putting on. And that means we're going to need a new water pump and an alternator because those are things you don't want to have to replace once everything is already together and in the car. So for that we turn to the Duralast brand because we're looking for something that's going to have great longevity and work just as good or better than the OE stock components. They offer a cast iron version, which is a direct replacement for the original, but they also offer a heavy duty aluminum version that has the exact same dimensions, but is about seven pounds lighter and saving weight in a car is always good. Both of these parts are made with completely new components. They're not remanufactured, they are brand new. We're also going to be installing a new alternator, so we're going to use a Duralask Gold. These are made also with completely new components and they are triple tested throughout the manufacturing process to make sure that they work just as good or better than their OE counterparts. These components are going to work great and they're going to last a long time in our sleeper streetcar. After laying down silicone, the water pump gasket is pressed on and then we'll apply a little more silicone. Finally, the water pump is bolted down. All these shiny new pieces would definitely go against the sleeper concept of this build. So we gave the engine a patina finish using Ford blue and matte black paint and a little dirt to age everything. Stealthy. Up next, it may not look like much now, but the small block has got the goods where it counts, in the dyno cell. We've shown testing on carburetor sizing before, and today we want to take a minute to talk about the different styles of carburetors, how they're rated, and what factors can actually affect carburetor sizing. We'll start with the basics. Carburetors are described normally by the flange they bolt to and how many barrels or venturis they have. Generally, we see one barrel, two barrel, or four barrel carburetors, and in performance applications, we're usually using a 4150 or square bore flange, or a 4500 dominator flange. The industry standard for carburetor sizing is by flow in cubic feet per minute. This is tested on specially calibrated flow benches, but the difference comes in how the carburetors are tested. One and two barrel carburetors are tested at three inches of vacuum, while four barrel carburetors are tested at one and a half inches of vacuum. This seems confusing, but one and two barrel carburetors are generally going to see more manifold vacuum below the throttle blades, so it gives a better indication of how the carburetor will react during normal operation. There's a simple formula to determine how much airflow an engine will need that you can easily do to give you a rough idea of the carburetor size you will need. You take the engine's displacement in cubic inches, multiply it by the max RPM the engine will see, and divide it by 3,456. This is a good starting point, but we have shown and generally see that a larger carburetor will make more horsepower. The big misnomer here is that a carburetor that is too big will flood the engine with fuel, and that's simply not the case. The carburetor itself limits how much air can enter the engine, but the fuel metering system, meaning the main jets, power valves, and air bleeds, along with how much air actually enters the engine, is what determines fuel flow. That means if the tune-up is right, drivability and power will not be adversely affected. There are other factors that go into carburetor sizing, and just like everything else in engine building, it's application specific. Things like what type of manifold, whether it's a dual plane or a single plane, and what kind of operation the engine is going to see, whether it's going to see low or high RPM acceleration rates are big factors. If you need help figuring out what size carburetor you need for your engine, you can use Summit Racing's online CFM calculator or talk to the experts at Summit Racing, they'll get you sorted out. For our engine, we're using the QFT Black Diamond 950 four barrel carb with a 4150 flange. For the sake of time, we've got everything bolted to the engine that was in the car. We have the entire accessory drive on, but we are not going to run the AC belt because, well, we're not running AC in the dyno room. But we have everything broken and tuned up. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make a few runs to make sure the engine is fine. Now keep in mind, this is a street engine on pump gas. Yeah, so because it's a street engine, uh, I figure we do our first pull from 3,500 to 6. Nice streetable range. Um, we've got. 35 degrees of timing, that's what we found that the engine wanted, um, and, and air fuel in the mid-13s uh, with our 950. Oh, wait. This. Don't blow it up.
a nice little yeah. engine. All right, not bad. 442.5 pound feet and 490.3 horsepower right at 6,000. All right. That's about well, what we expected. If you were stopping right here, it would be a really great street engine, but looks can be deceiving. We built this one to look docile, but not be as docile as it looks, if that makes any sense. So what we're going to do now is we are going to step up the RPM range. Now, we are going to put it up there because we have enough induction, we have enough camshaft. Keep in mind, solid roller, good yeah. set of heads, good manifold, 950 CFM QFT black diamond. So, yeah. uh, and our valve train is set up specifically for this. So it is. We're going to move out of the street range and go into 5,000 to 7,500 at the same rate. 7,500? Yeah. Oh. Five hundred and thirty-one point two horsepower and four hundred and forty-three point five pound feet. That's nice. Yeah, and peak power happened. Let's see, right at seventy-one hundred. Our plan of maybe quieting this down might not work as well as we think. But I think you know we get that. Yeah, we get that a lot that people they think that single planes can't. You know, there's not they're not they're not street manifolds or you know you can't put a big carburetor on a street engine, but. I think this thing's going to run just fine. It's going to run just fine the way it is, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun in the old frame rails of the, yeah. uh, of, uh, the spicy Granada there. So. Heck yeah, well, nice good job. day. Happy times. If you want to see more cool builds and more cool content, go check out our website. We just gave the Granada about 400 more horses to play with. All that extra power demands some serious upgrades. Today on Engine Power, we are getting back on one of our favorite projects that we have done in a while, our 1977 Ford Granada Ghia. It's even Vista Orange. Now, we brought this car in because it was a low mile car we just could not live without. And we chassis dynoed it and it made dismal power. So we pulled the engine and made a couple of street modifications to it to spice it up a bit. Check it out. There we go. It didn't like a wide open throttle. <laughs> that was a little rough. Definitely starting to miss there. <laughs> Not bad though. 101 <laughs> and 185 triple pound Triple digits. Feet. It made triple digits on the first I hit. mean, that's that's not bad. These things made like 120 or 130 uh, yeah. stock. So, you know, that's, that's what they claim, so. When most people think of their favorite cars from the 70s, the Granada does not often make the list. But honestly, we like almost everything about it, except for the underpowered engine. We've decided to make this Ford a sleeper of sorts, adding a stroked 347, along with several other high performance upgrades. We removed the exhaust, transmission, and finally, the engine. The teardown went great until we discovered that the block had been bored 60 over, and our new pistons are 30 over. Fortunately, we had a 30 over block from a previous project. With the donor block in the Sun and SV15, we torque plate honed it for proper piston skirt clearance and cylinder finish, opening up the bores by one and a half thousandths. In case we decide to run a power adder, the rings were gapped at 26 thousandths on the top and 28 thousandths on the second. Then we assembled the 4032 Alloy Forged Molly pistons and the Eagle 5400 Long Forged H beam rods. Finally, the rotating assembly could come together. A custom ground billet solid roller camshaft was next. Intake duration at 50 thousandths lift is 248 degrees with the exhaust at 260 degrees. Lobe separation angle is 110 degrees. The cam was degreed at 105 degrees of intake centerline, which is four and a half degrees advanced. Comp solid roller lifters, AFR Renegade 205 cylinder heads, 6850 long push rods, and Jessel 1.6 ratio shaft rockers completed the top end. 
After installing an Edelbrock Victor Jr. intake manifold and a Duralast water pump, we camouflaged all of the aftermarket parts on this engine with a patina paint job. Then we headed to the dyno cell. and 31.2 horsepower and 443.5 pound-feet. That's nice. Yeah, and peak power happened, let's see, right at 7,100. Our plan of maybe quieting this down might not work as well as we think, but I think, you know, we get that, yeah, we get that a lot, that people, they think that single planes can't, you know, there's not, they're not, they're not street manifolds or, you know, you can't put a big carburetor on a street engine, but I think this thing's gonna run just fine. It's gonna run just fine the way it is, and uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun in the old frame rails of, uh, yeah. of uh, the spicy Granada there, so. Heck yeah, well, nice good job. day. <laughs> Happy times. Now, since you last saw our 347, we got it off the dyno, off the dyno cart, and onto a regular engine stand. So it should be ready to go right in. The only problem we're gonna run into is the headers are not gonna fit in the car. I've already measured it. We're gonna have to figure something else out. We did have some concerns from people that this wasn't going to be a street engine with the solid roller and the single plane intake, but it's going in a street car and it's gonna run just fine. The headers on the engine are just for use on the dyno so we'll remove them. This gives us clean access to the old, worn out engine mounts which need replacing. Since this is probably gonna be the last time the engine gets dropped in our car, we wanted to take a minute and replace the motor mounts because these are looking a little worse for wear. The rubber's starting to crack and deteriorate and with all the extra power we're gonna be making, we don't wanna risk having a worn motor mount fail and the engine moving around inside the engine bay. So we're gonna put a new set on and we got them from rockauto.com. It's really easy to find. We just broke it down by year, make and model. So we searched for a 77 Ford Granada, picked the 302 option and there were several options. These came at a great price and they're gonna do a great job of keeping our engine in place, but not compromising that street ride that we're looking for. All we have to do is take the old bracket off of the old mount. We're gonna get it prepped and painted to match and then we can get them bolted on the engine and get it slid into place. Several coats of black engine enamel will prevent corrosion on the brackets. These mounts were roughly $10 a piece, so we'd be foolish not to replace them. Up next, we've said it before and we'll say it again. If something doesn't fit, make it fit. Yeah. We're back on engine power installing the 347 in our Granada. Oh, missed the hood ornament by 30 thousandths. Yeah. This road race front sump oil pan wasn't designed specifically for a Granada, but it fits like a glove. And since the rest of the engine is dimensionally identical to the one that came out earlier, we have little trouble getting it into place. There it goes. This is the pan. Right? Okay, yep, go down. Look at that. Jumped right in there, right? Jumped in. Well, it came out, so it should go in. Well, now comes the hard part. Well, <laughs> now this was the point where we know this will be the most difficult part of it is headers. Yeah. Not a lot of people make performance headers for a Granada. Right so. around none. Yeah. So, so this uh, is a very common, I don't know what I'm doing with this. I'm, I don't it's know. A, it's a we, have, we have that set. We have a set for a, a 75 through 77 Maverick probably going to be close, but we won't know for sure. I don't know what the, if no. there might be some differences, but we'll see. There's going to be some differences. Probably steering is the biggest concern, right? I don't, and this side looks pretty common and there's. Well, that side has the, has the starter in the way. There's this a starter the in the box. way and all that. So, uh, so we'll see. I don't know. We'll get, try them and then go Get them out and if uh, we have ways to make them work. Going to have to. We found these Hooker 1 and 5 8 inch primary headers at Summit Racing Equipment. They have a smaller primary, but a longer tube than the dyno headers we used before. I don't know if these are gonna I, I, fit. I already don't like this. They're already not probably gonna. No. Well, they're not gonna come that way, that's for sure. Um, no. That's okay. 
Before you so. do that, pull a, pull a plug out because... Well, I'm not even close yet. I think what we're gonna have to do is uh, jerk the engine back up, try and wiggle them in with the engine, and we'll pull the plugs just so they don't get hit. It's just so they don't get broke. Not the most popular car to put a set of headers on, so I understand why well, we're having so many problems, but... Not a lot of performance parts for Granada, if you notice. In a perfect world, we would just build headers for it. Yeah, I'd say, you know, it would take a good amount of time, but we could make some, you know, some big, oh, you can big make, primary yeah. headers that fit really nice. Uh, we're just trying to do it the maybe a little bit simpler way, kind of mm -hmm. use what we can get. Cherry. That is not bad right there. No, that's the, that's because it's got that uh, it's got that 950 on it that we're gonna run on the street. That 950 makes good power. And it's gonna run just fine. The big problem people have with carburetors is they think they give too much fuel. Well, when you step on the gas and whip the blades open, it wants to take a big gulp of air and it has to have fuel that goes with it. That's where you run into a lot of your stumbling problems, you a lot of, yeah. a lot of problems with the car when a lot of doesn't times, do what it's supposed to. People get the, you know, they don't realize how much the idle kind of affects the transition and they'll get the idle a little bit off and then it, you know it makes the transition really if you get the really idle wonky. circuit off it will it will absolutely kill the transition yeah. and even partial throttle stuff is pretty easy but the, the, when things if you stop it down and it doesn't That's do nice. anything there's a couple things you can do to make it work but this is going to yeah. work just fine I'm, I'm, I'm getting distracted by by plugs and we're, we're the, the, that's the easy part the hard part yeah. is getting the header works. So I think we, we hook up the hoist, try and slide it in there with the engine, and then you we know, jack the engine up. Yeah, give that an attempt, and if that doesn't work, then we'll start cutting. I think we're just gonna start cutting, but we'll give Probably, her a shot first. We have to say we tried. Now we're stuck. Flange through a little bit. It's hooked on this. Well, I gotta go the other way, not that way. Dude. That's close. Hold on. It's in-ish. It's in the right spot. And you see, right now the engine's forward an inch, and it's hitting the fire, and the headers are lined up, and they're hitting the firewall. So I think. Sides out, it's okay. Other than that, I think we're gonna have to cut these back two tubes out because the ones that have that weird L, because they're just gonna run into the firewall the whole time. Why don't we? Pull that thing back out, cut those tubes off, stick, and then we'll it, stick, it, back stick it back on, yeah. and then route some tubes. Yeah. We hate to cut up a new set of headers, but since they don't fit in the bandsaw, the easiest way to do this is with a Forney abrasive cutoff wheel. Anywhere you make a cut, make sure to leave enough clearance to weld all the way around the tube. Now that our two pipes are cut out, we can get the header in there and see what we have to do for routing. We also went ahead at the same time and cut off the collector flange because there will probably be some interference on the floor. When you're doing something like this where something is not actually designed to go into what you're using it for, it takes a delicate balance of precise measurement and brute force to sometimes make things work. It should fit now. Now that the floor is precisely massaged to what we like, we'll get it back in and see what's up. After dry fitting the replacement tubes, the headers are removed and tacked. Then they're put back into place for a final check of fitment before they are fully welded. We'll also weld a stainless V-band onto the collector to replace the piece we cut off. Even though this particular set of headers was designed for a different application, they seem to go into this side extremely easy. Well, that's good, because this side took a lot more work, but we have our tubes welded in, we have some O2 bungs to monitor O2s standalone, and we also have V-bands on the end so we can build our exhaust back from there. This should slide in now, but we are probably gonna have to put the transmission in before we bolt it in for real. I, I agree with that, so we'll go up in the air and uh, jam her in there. Yep. Up next, the 347 receives an upgraded transmission that's built for action on the street. 
We're going to be replacing our stock C4 with an upgraded one, but before we can do that, we obviously have to install the flex plate. Because this engine makes the power level it does and turns a high amount of RPM, we opted for an SFI approved flex plate in our transmission kit. We're not necessarily going to do any racing with the car, but it's just a little bit of extra insurance for us. We're also going to need some quality fasteners because of that power level and RPM. So obviously we turned to ARP fasteners and got their flex plate bolt kit. These are made from 8740 chrome molly and they are heat treated to a tensile strength of around 180,000 PSI, which is going to be much stronger than the stock fasteners or even a grade 8 from the hardware store. They come with a great instruction sheet that tells you everything you need to do. So we have ARP ultra torque lube underneath the heads and we're putting some thread locker on them before they're installed and torqued down. We also went ahead and got one of their bell housing bolt kits. We've put ARP ultra torque underneath the heads and on the threads. These are going to be much stronger than the stock ones and as an added bonus, the head is a little bit smaller so it's easier to get to when you're trying to get them installed. All we have to do is get the flex plate on, then we can get our torque converter and transmission slid into place. We'll put blue thread locker onto the bolts before they are torqued to 85 pound feet. This is the transmission we're going to be using in the car. It's still a C4, but it's been upgraded and is part of a performance automatic street smart package that we found at Summit Racing Equipment. The car is still going to be used on the street, so it has their street strip valve body, which is a full automatic valve body, so it'll work just like the stock one, but it's going to have increased line pressure and firmer shifts. It also has heavy duty clutches throughout and their billet pro shift servo and billet cover. It comes with a deep cast aluminum oil pan, which is going to be stronger than a stock steel one, have increased fluid capacity and a drain for easy servicing. The Street Smart kit also came with a new dipstick, a mid plate, the flex plate that we just installed, and a matching torque converter. This converter is an 11 inch and is rated for a 2500 RPM stall speed. Ours will be a little bit different than that because stall speed is directly dependent on vehicle weight and how much horsepower the engine makes. We will also be filling the entire operation with some hot shot secret Adrenaline NS Nano Shift Racing Transmission Fluid. We're not trying to fill the converter, we're just putting enough in to avoid starting it dry. It's critical to make sure that the converter is fully seated, otherwise the transmission can be seriously damaged during installation. Since the Performance Automatic is the same model as our old transmission, we know it'll fit just fine. Wiggle and push, wiggle and push. There we go. That's in. Up next, we take care of our Granada's cooling system. The Granada's stock fan is getting replaced with one designed for higher RPM. It will function the same, but provide an extra measure of safety. We found this aftermarket radiator for a 70 through 75 Granada that almost drops right in. The only thing we needed was a hose adapter that we got from Summit Racing Equipment. We're upgrading the transmission cooler lines with a set of custom Earl's flexible AN lines. Because this is a performance application that we're going to be running on the street, we're going to be adding an external transmission cooler. The higher horsepower output and the higher stall speed of our converter are going to add more heat into the transmission fluid. So we went to Summit Racing and we found this Hayden Automotive transmission cooler. This is really nice because it looks and feels OE and all we had to do was build this quick bracket that uses some factory holes. We also cut a big hole in the back for air to go through and we tried to make it as small as possible so it doesn't restrict flow to the condenser 
or the radiator. The front line out of our transmission is the feed line. So it will come out and go into the radiator transmission cooler, and then it will come out from there, go into the top of this one, be cooled even further before it comes out the bottom and is returned to the rear of our transmission. This transmission cooler came with a set of radiator zip ties to mount it, but we sleep better at night and have the extra gratification of building a solid bracket that will last forever. We gave the Granada plenty of power. Today, we take care of everything else. Our Ford receives a beefy rear end, updated suspension, and more. Then we give it a shot of the giggle gas. Hey everyone, we are still on our 1977 Ford Granada Ghia project here in Engine Power. This car is coming out great and it is going to be a mean sleeper. To get caught up on what we've done to this car so far, have a look at this. On our baseline dyno run, we got rear wheel numbers of 101 horsepower and 186 pound-feet of torque. Weak. Once we tore down the engine and discovered that the block was 60 over, we decided to use a different block that would accommodate our 30 over pistons. Then we filled that block with a forged rotating assembly, a custom ground billet solid roller camshaft, 205cc cylinder heads, 1.6 ratio shaft rockers, and more. Since we wanted the Granada to be a sleeper, we gave the engine a patina paint job. In the dyno cell, the engine was good for a stout 531 horsepower and 443 pound-feet of torque. Next, we modified a set of hooker headers designed for a mid-70s Maverick so they would fit in our Ford. Then we turned our attention to the rest of the car. Since we're making more RPM and more power, we installed an upgraded C4 designed for higher performance applications. We also upgraded the cooling system with an aftermarket radiator and an external transmission cooler. Now, even though we have a ton of stuff already done, it's going to take a lot more to get this thing running and on the road. What do you think? Pitter patter, let's get at her. I've heard that before. To free up anything that's stuck, Seafoam Deep Creep Penetrating Lubricant is extensively used. Next, we'll remove all of the rear brake line connections, followed by the shocks. After that, the stock leaf spring nuts are zipped off. Once the mounting hardware is removed, the rear end comes free from the vehicle. Now that we got our old 8-inch out, we're going to be replacing it with the tried-and-true Ford 9-inch axle. Surprisingly enough, there isn't an off-the-shelf option for a Ford Granada, but this was specifically designed for a 64 through 66 Mustang. And after doing some measuring and looking at the spec sheet, this should go right in. It also came with a set of 31 spline axles that already have the studs installed in the right bolt pattern, so it should be really easy. Along with that, the other thing we found at Summit Racing is a complete third member assembly from Curry with their twin track differential and 411 gearing. Now, this is going to take advantage of our engine's power band. And this is going to hold up just fine, even though we're not really going to be beating on this thing. Only when the ignition's on. Anti-seize goes on the studs, so the nuts can be easily removed, just in case we want to swap the gear ratios sometime in the future. Once the axle shaft is in, the axle retainer, which doubles as the caliper mount, gets tightened up. We opted for a brand new set of leaf springs that are an OEM replacement for the old ones. Instead of the stock lower plate, we're installing a set of Caltrax. This setup helps plant the tires harder at the drag strip, which is almost inevitable for this project. Before we set the rear end on the ground, we'll bolt up a set of wheels and tires from Coker Tire. More on these later. The other half of the Caltrax get mounted to the front of the leaf spring. The provided lubricant keeps things moving freely. This is 
should be able to squeeze it. There we go. New bushings and shackles complete the install. Up next, the Granada gets rear disc brakes, a fuel system upgrade, and new shocks. Then we'll strap it down to the chassis dyno and give it a shot of nitrous. One of the biggest upgrades we're going to be doing to our Granada is changing the rear brake setup from drums to disc. We got this Right Stuff rear disc conversion kit from Summit Racing Equipment, and they had a bunch of them in stock, but we specifically chose this one because it has an 11 and a quarter inch rotor, which we can make clear our 14 inch wheels, and that will be very important later on. It comes with a single piston integral parking brake caliper, so it's going to run and drive and stop just like a modern vehicle. We've already got our brackets bolted on and spaced correctly for our rotor, so all we have to do is get the pads and calipers bolted on and we can continue on. This is a universal kit that comes with everything you need to convert a 9 inch axle to disc brakes. One of the most important steps is making sure that the caliper is positioned correctly on the rotor for proper operation and pad wear. The kit comes with easy to follow instructions and the only major modification we had to do was weld these brake hose brackets to the axle. When installing new brake components, it's always a good idea to change out rubber hose connections since they can cause potential leaks or even restrict fluid flow. Ready? It's going to be a gas fountain. Here we go. It's going to be a gas fountain. Just, yeah, there you go. Wow, that was really underwhelming. I feel way better now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's over. There you go. It's over. It's going to come out all of a sudden. Here we go. When working on older vehicles, typically the first thing you will do before you run it is change the fuel tank. When these cars sit around, they will get condensation on the inside, you'll get some corrosion and rust, and that causes all kinds of problems. So we opted to get a brand new tank from rockauto.com. This is a precision engineered tank that is a 19 gallon replacement for the old 18 gallon one, but it will go right back in where the old one was. It is galvanized material and made to last a lifetime. What we love about rockauto.com is even though we are working on a 1977 Granada, they had what we need to get back on the road. So we're going to take this and get it ready to go back in the car. We ran our engine on the dyno with a 950 QFT Black Diamond, and we're going to be using that in the car as well. In order to feed it, though, we're going to be using Holly's Retrofit In-Tank Fuel Pump Module. These are designed to be used on stock tanks without any welding, so it's nice and safe. This unit's really nice because it comes with a billet low-profile top, an easy mounting solution, and a thick foam insert to seal against any imperfections in the surface. This one came with a 450 liter per hour pump, which is enough to support 875 horsepower in EFI applications or 1100 horsepower in carved applications, which is going to be plenty. It also came with their Hydromat, which acts as a pickup, a filter, and prevents fuel starvation during fuel sloshing in the tank. To regulate it down, we got one of their billet adjustable regulators that goes from 4.5 to 9 psi, and the kit came with the fittings and a mechanical fuel pressure gauge. It can be a little daunting because you have to put a large hole in the top of your fuel tank, but the kit comes with great instructions, and if you follow them, it makes it nice and easy. The easiest way to punch the hole is with a large hole saw. It's important to make sure you remove the cut metal and any small metal chips that end up in the tank. Following the kit's instructions, we'll measure the depth of our tank and cut the supply and return hoses accordingly. With the fuel pump bracket also cut to size, we can install it and the pump itself. With everything together, the pump is fed into the tank, making sure that the hydromat is oriented towards the center of the fuel tank. When tightening the mounting screws, the swing out mounting lugs extend and compress the foam to seal the tank. It doesn't get much easier than that. Dash 6 connections on both the feed and the return are tightened up on the pump. The tank fits like a glove. We even reused the stock straps. Perfect. For the rear shocks, we spec'd out some QA1 double adjustable units that are actually made to fit a Torino. But we flipped them upside down, put on 2 inch extensions, and bolted them in. We had a custom drive shaft made by Precision Shaft Technologies in Clearwater, Florida. It's a steel shaft with a slip yoke and 1330 U-joints. It's built to handle our power level and RPM. 
Up next, we design a dual muffler exhaust to keep our Granada relatively quiet. This car wouldn't be a sleeper without a deceptively quiet exhaust. To do that, we're using the Summit Racing 304 Stainless Builders Kit, a vibrant performance Y pipe, and Summit's B band flanges. This will take both 3 inch collectors into a single 3 inch pipe before it goes through a catalytic converter and two Stainless Works mufflers that we also found at Summit Racing. We'll mock up the entire exhaust and tack everything solidly in place. The V-band connections make it easy to disassemble so it can fully weld everything outside of the car. You might be wondering why we're installing a catalytic converter. A, this is a street car. B, we're trying to kill as much noise as possible. This 18-inch long oval muffler and 20-inch long 5-inch round muffler will help with sound control as well. The piece de resistance are the three inch Summit Racing electric cutouts that will allow us to uncork it and let it sing with just a flick of a switch. Now that everything is fully welded, we can install the exhaust for real. The exhaust is supported by Summit Racing rubberized hangers. Ooh, that's nice. Oh, oh my. Stainless steel might seem like overkill, but it will last a long time between the frame rails of our Granada. Plus, it just looks awesome. One of the important aspects of our Granada sleeper build is that we wanted it to look as stock as possible, and that meant retain the stock hubcaps. So we had to get a different set of wheels and tires, and we turned to Coker tire for that. We picked up a set of steel smoothies for the front and the rear, 14 by eight here, 14 by seven up front. These have two bolt patterns, five by four and a half and five by four and three quarter, depending on what your setup is. These wheels have a four inch back spacing, which fits our car perfectly. And the tires, we went with a BF Goodrich Radial TA, P245 60R14 in the rear and a P205 70R14 in the front. This setup is a huge improvement over the P195s that were on the car before. Best of all, stock hubcap goes right on. We mounted this MSD start and step retard box inside where the ashtray would go. This allows us to retard timing for starting and have a triggered retard for nitrous. Best of all, it's nice and hidden. The rest of the ignition system consists of an MSD blaster ignition coil and an MSD off-road ignition box. We hid this one underneath the dash to not draw any extra attention. No sleeper would be complete without some sort of nitrous. We picked up an NOS cheater plate system that's adjustable up to 250 horsepower. We've obscured it as much as possible underneath the stock air cleaner. We also tucked away two 10-pound NOS nitrous bottles in the truck. Up next, we put the Granada on the roller, and we like what we see. <clears throat> we got our 1977 Ford Granada pretty much finished up and strapped onto the chassis dyno in all of its sleeper gloriousness. If you remember, this engine made 531 horsepower at 7,100 RPM at the crank, but we've added some serious restrictions. Boy, have we ever. We have a mechanical fan on the front, which is great for street driving because it's always pulling air in, but that will kill some power. Also has a one in five eighths header. On the dyno, it had one in seven eighths, so we have some restriction in the exhaust. And speaking of that, now we have a two into one single exhaust. It has a catalytic converter and two mufflers, so uh, that's gonna cork it off. Yeah, we're gonna see how much it kills, but the good news is, it's going to be very quiet, which is going to be great because this is a street car. It's super quiet, and I can't wait because I can still play the 8-track player and hear it. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, I think we're good. Go ahead, start her up, and let's make some closed exhaust pools. Oh, let me, let me turn that off. Here we go. Is that glorious or what? That's, that's like insanely quiet compared to what it was. That's street car level. Okay, there's high gear. All right. Are you ready?
that uh, that oil we put on the engine is smoking. Yeah, I know. That's not bad. 324 and 288 pound feet. So that is a giant power suck right there. 324. That's a lot. Wow. Wow, that killed it. Not even gonna shut it off. We're gonna open the headers and make another pump. Heck yeah. Back to streetcar Back status. To street car. So it made 443. 443? That's crazy. So that's 120 ish in the exhaust. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Wow, but that, that's yeah. about right because that's about what we thought it would make. Yeah, it made 375 for torque. I saw you were bouncing it off the rev limiter there. Yeah. yeah. We got the rev limiter set because I'm minorly worried it's going to sling the belts off. Yeah. They're, they were not made for high RPM use. No. So. And we turned out 75 on the dyno, so that's what we set the rev limiter at. So. Yeah. Woo! Wow, that's, I mean, that's about what we thought it was going to do, but that's, that's pretty good. Well, you, you know what's next, right? Yeah, I think. I think we need to close the exhaust and we need to start putting it on the giggle juice. Yeah, I think, uh, what's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Nitrous, rule of thumb, is you pull one degree of timing per 50 horse yeah. of nitrous. I was just going to do a hundred shot on this one, but I, I did 125 just to say we, we did 125. <laughs> just to be safe, yeah. Just to, just to be safe. So what we're going to do is, by rights, we should take about four degrees of timing yeah. out of it, or five degrees of timing. I'm going to do our handy dandy timing flip down. Yeah. Flip down. I'm, gonna take, I'm not opposed to being safe. Yeah. I'm going to take six degrees out of it. That sounds good, yeah. This will be interesting. This will be very Full interesting. Full exhaust, 125 shot. Let's see what it does. Arm. Purge. Purge it. Yes. We're good. All right. See what she does. Four hundred and sixteen horsepower Woo! and three hundred and sixty-six pound feet. So that's about right. You know, being conservative on the timing means we're probably not going to get the full oh, one twenty-five. No, no, and I'm... also it's diminishing return with the full exhaust. So, right. so that's that's pretty good. I mean, that's not bad. All right, now 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 time for the gusto. Yeah, time for the gusto. Open it, her up and here then we go. We'll make another hit. <laughs> this is gonna be exciting. That's awesome. 537 horsepower <clears throat> and 433 pound feet. Which that is nasty. It's freaking sweet, right? I mean, we kind of set this arbitrary goal of 500 at the wheel. Like, what would be cool in like a street car that maybe if you ever, you know, took it to the strip? <laughs> that's awesome. And, and holy God, holy. that's so cool. You just like close it back up, go back to the nice cruiser. Wow. Wow. That was exhilarating right there. That's awesome. That's sweet. All the vitals look great. Uh, it's nice because we have the holly dash in there, right? We put that in there. Yeah. That's the only thing that makes the interior not look stock, right? Yeah, I think. Be able to uh, use the standalone harness and just put the sensors in the engine, being able to have accurate data is awesome. That looked great. Everything looked great. Yeah. It, it, it zinged through the pole like I knew it was going to. Yeah, I mean, the, the AFRs were right on. Fuel pressure was good. Heck yeah. Man, that's so cool. Man, that is All a right. success right there. I think we need to check plugs, unstrap this thing, and go give it a cruise. We need to go take this for a cruise. Yeah. To see more of our Sleeper Granada or any of the other cool projects we do, go check out our website. Today on Engine Power, we take the spicy Sleeper Granada on the street, down the strip, and up to the intergalactic Ford Fest. All right. 
this is an exciting day. So we are out of the shop in engine power because we are taking our 1977 Ford Granada sleeper out on the street. This was built as a street car, so it wouldn't be much of a street car if we didn't take it around town and cruise it, right? Correct, we are downtown and you know, there's a lot of question on how streetable a car is with a giant carburetor on it that makes a whole bunch of power at high RPM. Well, that's how it starts, right? Single plane manifolds and giant carburetors are always a source of people saying that will have terrible street manners. Well, it really depends on the tune-up of the carburetor, right? And we've talked about this before, that just because it's a large carburetor doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to drive poorly. It's definitely a factor of, you know, having the carburetor adjusted right, having the idle adjusted right, and the trans the transition circuit adjusted right. Mm -hmm. And on this one, we've got her pretty dialed in. So this thing runs and drives very, very nicely. It has great throttle response. It has great transition from idle to throttle. It has everything that a street car would have. Granted, it makes a lot of power. Yeah. Now, the way this thing is set up, it doesn't start to come on like really good power until like 5,000 RPM. But that makes it drive really nice because with that performance automatic C4 that we put in, that has a relatively tight converter, which we did because it's a street car. If we were taking this to the drag strip as a pure drag car, we obviously would have put a much uh, higher stall in it. But this one's about 26 to 2800. So it drives really nice on the street. It drives like a modern car would. Obviously, it doesn't sound exactly like a modern <laughs> car, but we've quieted down a good bit with the exhaust, which was which was really cool because it's so quiet for what it is. And then when you open it, people are just shocked. I you am know? so tempted to open the headers right now. I but know, it just scare people. We are downtown, people. it'll scare everybody. Yeah. Now, we are in street traffic. We are idling through traffic. We are at operating temperature. Yep. Um, the, the thing is idling right now in gear. It's a 77. I you have to open. That. Heck yeah, you have to open them no, now. No, 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 no. <laughs> this thing is so comfy, right? Because we didn't want to oh mess with the car too much where, you know, it has a really harsh ride or it looks weird or anything like that. So we didn't touch the outside. But all we did really for the rear end, we got a new stock leaf springs and those QA1 double adjustables and some uh, some traction bars. So this thing rides relatively nice. We didn't really mess with the front end too much because we wanted to keep that soft plush ride and it still has it. The big thing on street stuff, so what has to work? Has to have good cooling, right? Yep. Because you're sitting around a lot. It yep. has to have good metering of the fuel because if it's yep. if it's coughing and choking and spitting and sputtering, yeah, then, then it just makes it a, a, a pain to drive. Yeah, and the big thing is that uh, I think sometimes people forget, you know, we make dyno pools at wide open throttle, but when you're driving around the street, you're not using any of that. So if the engine makes, you know, considerably less power at, at say 2,500, well, when are you at 2,500 and full throttle unless you're leaving a stoplight, which the engine blows through that almost immediately right. anyways, it, you know? It so it just ignites a tire. So I, People are liking it too, look. <laughs> what do you think it's gonna do if you stop it? You think it's gonna cough? Or do you think it's gonna just take off like this? I think it's gonna take off. Well, I, I wouldn't be afraid to literally drive this car anywhere. Yeah. This is, this is a daily. In, in oh, 100%. Right it's smooth on the throttle. The throttle, yep. the throttle is, I'm not saying it's overly sensitive, but if you give it input, <laughs> it does what you want. Yeah, and the brakes work good too. I mean, yeah, having that, that having that all around wheel, disc set up. Wheel disc. Yeah, it's gonna is way better than the drums because that they were they were okay, but they definitely were not great when the car came in. So this car, that's a huge upgrade. This car is sporty. Yeah, it's sporty but classy. <laughs> yeah. Right already, so it runs great on the street. But how about at the strip? Up next, we'll show you. Our 77 Granada Sleeper is definitely a street car, and we've put some serious street miles on it. But we wanted to take it to a drag strip. We know a lot of you guys want to see that as well. So we are here at Etheridge Motorsports Park, which is a great local eighth mile all concrete track near us. It's a beautiful day. We have a beautiful facility. What more could you ask for? I know what we could ask for. Drag strip runs. Now, we are going to run this car in several different configurations. The first one, straight off the street. Street tires, closed exhaust. Hell, I'm even going to leave it in drive. And then we're going to change things up. Some slick open up the exhaust and definitely hit it with the spray so uh hey they just don't pay us to look cute let's make some runs let's go we're gonna leave it right and drive and just floorboard it Yeah, I'm 
wasn't bad. Well, that was about as nice as I could do it. Yeah, I mean, what did it What was it? Nine ninety. Oh, it got in the it got in the nines. Yeah, I'll take that. I mean, for street tires, didn't I mean didn't spin? No, I it uh, wasn't. I mean, it wasn't horrible. I wasn't expecting much. It's not going to launch hard with the converter, you Absolutely know. Absolutely not. I and think, I it, think this, that was pretty good. This pushes it really hard at two thousand. Like I, I was yeah. obviously foot braking it, and I was trying to be really easy on it. Yeah. But where did uh, it shift in drive? Uh, it shifted really low. I mean, I, I, it was probably it was under five thousand. <laughs> oh well, that's no good. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, I, what? What if? Uh, well, I don't know. What if I roll it out and manually shift it? That's why I think that's the first step is is manually shift it. Uh, see what it does there, and then then we can start throwing slicks on it. Is it messing my hair up the helmet? Yeah. Was that any better? That was way better. <laughs> Uh, a little smoky. I think that's just the stock valve covers and the, and the, and the stock breathers type. Uh -huh. It's a little smoky, but I don't think it's too bad. The only thing better than a day at the track is a day at the track with your buddies. Tommy from Detroit Muscle brought their newest project, an 83 First Olds. With an Olds 455 built by Joe Mondello and Engine Power that puts out 506 horsepower and 539 pound-feet, street tire traction was definitely hard to come by. One of the things we're going to be doing to take our car from street mode into strip mode is changing out the rear wheels and tires for a set of slicks. We went to Summit Racing and we found these Hoosier Quick Time Pros. They're a 26 by 9.5, so they're the same size as the tire we have on there, but they're going to work way better here at the strip. Now, they're still a 14 inch wheel. That means we can still retain our stock hubcap, which adds to the extra stealthiness. I even took the time to remove the white lettering from the tire to add to the sleeper effect. I don't think we're fooling anybody. No. We mounted and balanced this set back at the shop, so all we have to do is swap them out. With the added traction, we're ready to open up our exhaust cutouts for a major horsepower increase. That was significantly better. Yeah, I mean way better. I mean, we know that the engine picks up like 120 with the exhaust open, so kind of expecting that, but that was pretty good. Two things. One, raise the rev limiter. Yep, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, two, uh, I mean, the converter is so tight, it's shifting out of second, of second gear yeah. by itself at about 4,800. Yeah, I heard that, and I didn't know if that was you or, or the transmission that itself. That was actually, what's well, a street I, transmission? I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but. Uh, no, I mean, it's, you know, again, street car, not a drag car. Correct. So. Uh, if, we, if this was a true race car, you'd have a trans brake in it and a manual yeah, valve and, body. Yeah, manual valve body with floor shifter. This is a fast street car. Yeah. And we haven't hit the, the spray. Yeah, exactly, so we, we and, still have a little bit left. And, and opening the exhaust, that was a, yeah, that was a huge, that's that, almost a whole second. That is a whole second, that's over a whole second. So what's the next plan? I mean, unless you think you can pick up some ET somewhere, obviously we can't do anything really about the second gear shift. Right. Um, I, I think we move on to spray. We'll open up our twin 10 pound NOS nitrous bottles that will feed the 125 horsepower shot out of our nitrous plate system. I think uh, way better. That was a slight improvement. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, st still had the second gear early shift, but 702. 702. That's dangerously that's, close to the sixes. Yeah. I, I think with a little uh, with a little fetzer on it, I think we could get it yeah. in the sixes. I, I hit the rev limiter again. I heard that, and you know, but the car the didn't. car was actually skating around. It actually, back. yeah, I saw it was walking back and forth. It was but, walking back and forth, and that's uh, that was mildly. I bet that was a little concerning. That was a, that, yeah. that was a little concerning at, at some point, but I knew it was a good run. I, I thought it was probably uh, a team, but uh, that's pretty that's, good. That's pretty good. For the first time, taking our 3,800-pound streetcar to the track, 
we think 702 at 97 miles per hour is a huge success. We've got several ideas on how to make our sleeper Granada even quicker down the strip, but for now, that's a great day at the track.